I am here today with Sarah Bessie, author, podcaster, co-creator of the Evolving Faith Conference, and so much more. And Sarah, I just want to start by saying thank you for being here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm incredibly honored. So happy I was chatting with you ahead of time before we got on. And I just have been looking forward to visiting and getting to meet you. Well, meet in person, on video, whatever it is. But it, <laughs> it we it counts. It. by now, we're going to say that it counts. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I have felt the same way. And as I was saying to you before, sometimes I um, invite people to be guests on this podcast before I've even read a book because I know that I just want to have the conversation. So I have now (laughs) read your new book, um, which we're going to get to talk about sitting next to me, Field Notes for the Wilderness. But before we get there, I was thinking about people who might not be familiar with you and with your work. I think I first heard about you after your book, Jesus Feminist came out, which is 10 years ago. Um, So I've kind of been following, you know, from a distance for a while, but I'm sure there are people who have not been in that position who are listening to this podcast. So for people who are in that place, I'm just wondering if you could give us kind of a big picture introduction to Sarah Bessie, but especially as it relates to religion and spirituality and this, you know, kind of concept of evolving faith. Sure. Um, Well, let me think, where would be a good place to start? Um, so yeah, I'm a writer. Um, so the book that uh, you just read is, I think, my fifth, uh, the fifth that's seen the light of day. There have been, <laughs> <laughs> there have been a few that will. Uh, my sister is under contract to burn Cassandra Austin like at some point of, upon my demise. <laughs> so wow, we won't talk about those ones. But yeah, so this will be my fifth book. I wrote um, Jesus Feminist about yeah ten years ago now, um, and in addition to that. Um, there's been a couple other books, including a rhythm of prayer, which um, came out a couple years ago. And I think a lot of um, folks might even have some connection because of my work with Evolving Faith, yeah. um, which is a conference and a community and a podcast uh, that I started with my friend Rachel Held Evans and our friend Jim um, a number of years ago, um, and then continue uh, to lead and be part of a team, you know, over there. Um, so yeah, I think that those are probably the main places I write a newsletter. I'm from Canada, um, born and raised, uh, in Western Canada. I live in Calgary, Alberta, but actually this is where I grew up. And then I left for 25 years and then came back. So I've got that kind of weird experience of like feeling almost haunted by like your teenage self when you come around corners or you move through the city. Um, I'm a mom. I've got four kids. Um, my oldest is graduating high school this year. My youngest is just in grade three. So we're straddling a lot of Mm. different, um, stages of parenting. Uh, my husband, I've been married for coming up on 23 years now. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, that probably should cover most of it. I think. Yeah. We have some parallels in our stories and lives. Um, I have, written four books, depending on how you count it. Um, there was a self-published one, so we might call it five. And um, also ha- my husband and I have just returned to the place where we met, which is where we went to boarding school. So for high school. Oh, wow. yes. um, and so in terms of like running into your high school self at every turn, it's very strange to be also doing that. So I can relate to that for sure. Um, we only have three kids, but our oldest is also uh, finishing up high school. So we have lots of things in common, but um, I'd love to go. I think about uh, Krista Tippett, you know, the host of On Being. Her initial question for people is always like uh, talking about the spiritual or religious um, aspects of your childhood. Mm-hmm. And I would, I di- was wondering, especially in terms of that thinking about returning uh, to the place of your childhood, knowing also even just the language of evolving faith that uh, religion and spirituality has not been consistent or consistent might be the wrong word, has not been the same throughout your life Mm -hmm. journey. And that's a lot of what this book is about. So could you just talk a little bit about those early years of faith and or faith formation, maybe like what was what was religious life like in your childhood home? That is I've always loved that question. I I know. I feel like that's the kind of thing that I could sit with somebody quietly in a corner and talk about at a party, which mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe tips the cards that I'm an introvert. <laughs> Please, let's go sit in a corner and buy a <clears throat> small talk and get right to your <laughs> back. You and me both. I know. All right. So um, my parents are first generation believers mm-hmm. um, and came to faith when I was a child. Um, so we came to faith. Um, 
here in Canada, especially in the areas where I grew up, uh, here in the prairies, it wasn't it wasn't even that our parents' generation was the last kind of Judeo Christian in church kind of thing. It was like my grandparents' parents, mm. right? Who would have had that that kind of story. And so when we came to faith, it was it, it felt like turning everything upside down and inside out in a lot of ways. And it was, um, you know, a lot of mainstream uh, mainline churches were pretty empty in a lot of the communities that I grew up yeah. in. And so I was unwittingly and and at the time, you know, completely unaware or maybe even of our place in, in the larger story of Christianity. But we were part of that third wave neo-charismatic revival movement in like the 80s. Okay. And so small, happy, clappy, charismatic churches that met in like the leisure center. And you'd, play, <laughs> you'd play floor hockey after just, you know, kind of st- tongue talking, like bootleg copies of American preachers on you know, cassette tapes, you know, yeah. being passed surreptitiously back, you know, hand to hand. And so, I mean, in a lot of ways, there were a lot of gifts to that. It was, you know, a whole community of people who were on a very first name basis with resurrection, mm. um, a lot of misfits, you know, a lot of us mm. had no idea about where we maybe stood in the larger story of Christianity that was unfolding in the world. But there were, there can be some shadow sides to that too, I think. Um, the areas where we kind of found ourselves were very heavily word of faith influenced, um, prosperity gospel influenced. Um, and so, you know, there can be some things that are are great about that understanding. And then there can be some things that are profoundly, uh, they will give you baggage you were unpacking on the internet 30 years later. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so that is where we have landed, but, right. um, so, I mean, it's been a really beautiful thing. I think one of the things that I've really appreciated looking back now, um, in particularly maybe as a parent, is how in so many ways it was almost like coming to faith alongside of my parents. Yeah. How old were you and when you when you're, I would have been, you keep saying we, which I kind of love, we came yeah, to faith, you know? We did. Yeah, no, it yeah. did. It felt very much like a collective thing. I was in elementary school. Okay. And so I remember, you know, kind of life before and after. Um, but it was a really beautiful experience. Like I have really clear memories of like my mom coming to Sunday school with me. Hmm. Right. And then wanting her to teach it because she was a parent and her being like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what any of this is, but I will be happy to hand out scissors and glue and (laughs) hug every kid Hmm. who comes in. And I remember her sitting in like little kindergarten chairs with me. And her and I hearing stories about Jesus and looking at each other and her being like, isn't he amazing? Mm. And me being like, yes, <laughs> Jesus is so beautiful. Wow. And so, you know, this way of like, um, has meant that in a lot of ways, even the journey since then has been together. And yeah. so then even, you know, all these years later, um, watching my parents have go through their own faith uh, shift and their own evolving faith, their own, um, you know, clarification. Mm-hmm. I think it has made them more open to even some of the things and shifts and changes that I've had, because as opposed to seeing it as, you know, a rebellion against them and what they taught or whatever else, they see it more as we're growing up together still. Mm. Right. And we're still growing and understanding, growing in, in um, our love of God and our love of people together. Um, and so, yeah, they've done a really great job about keeping pace with us. Mm. Um, you know, and, and even staying curious, yeah. you know, about things maybe where we disagree and places here and there. So I think that's part of the reason with some of that language. I think some of the gifts that I really love about that early way of understanding was it was deeply rooted in like the goodness of God. Yeah. And that's something that I've held on to, even if maybe my way of understanding that has shifted and changed, mm-hmm. you know, there was no part of me that was like, God's out to get you. Or God's God's always angry with you. Yeah, or you're being these things are to punish you or whatever else. Like that wasn't at all how I was introduced to God, and mm-hmm. I don't know at the time if I understood how much of a gift that was. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, one of the themes of the book is just a returning to love and, and and not returning in the sense of having strayed away from it, just in the sense of like, we're going to keep going back here again and again and again. Um, and also to Jesus, like to this person who actually lived in a way that I can 
when I am starting to feel like, oh my gosh, what, what do I believe? What are the messages that I want to adhere to and follow? And where is all this confusion? It's like, okay, there's some kind of touch points or anchors. And at least my reading of your book was love and Jesus being at least two of those. <laughs> you're, not, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So I, this is so really early on in the book, you write, everything I knew about God had become a giant question mark. And this is from um, a scene of you and your husband in the desert at a gas station. Um, so that might uh, you know signal for you what age you are. I, I can tell it's kind of early on, but I'm not sure exactly when. Um, and I wondered if you could share with us what were some of those questions that had pushed you outside of the boundaries of that faith of your childhood and early adulthood? Um, mm -hmm. Where what were so, because I'm sure there are listeners who might be in that place of just like asking questions that feel like, oh my gosh, like there may, might be nothing there there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So that my first experience with what maybe I now now would maybe know to use language like deconstruction, mm -hmm. you know, or faith shift, which is not language that I had 20 years ago, <laughs> would yeah. have been helpful <laughs> to demystify and take maybe some of the angst and fear out of it, right? Because it's a profoundly isolating experience, mm. especially when you're deeply embedded in religious cultures and religious systems. And so at the time, I think a lot of the questions I had um, maybe masqueraded sometimes as questions about theology. Um, but at the end of the day, I think where I found myself really running up against the origin point almost for almost all of it um, was grief. Hmm. Right. And sometimes it would look like anger. Sometimes it would look a lot like, you know, rage or frustration or numbness or, um, you know, even disruption. Um, it was rarely pretty. You know, to be flailing all over my life. Um, but there was this larger thing going on. Of, and again, I think almost everybody comes to that place or that threshold maybe from a different perspective. But because I had grown up in a prosperity gospel, um, word of faith kind of, you know, way of understanding. Will you pause for a minute in case sure. there are people who don't know what prosperity gospel word of faith means? Like, just give right. us that context. Well, it is a profoundly American phenomenon within... Mm -hmm. Um, within the American evangelical kind of religious landscape. And we were, we were part of it even in Canada, right? And so in some ways there was some protection maybe from the border here and there in terms of like the intensity of some, some aspects of it that I've noticed, you know, since then. But it basically is this idea, um, you know, from a prosperity gospel perspective that God wants to bless you. Mm -hmm. And because God wants to bless you, that means health and wealth, um, you know, it, it's prosperity and body and finances and soul. Um, and word of faith oftentimes will clasp hands with prosperity gospel and say, you know, the, the words of scripture are promises from God, um, quite literal oftentimes. And so, you know, you can pray with authority. There's this narrative of certainty and victory to mm. it, right? And so coming of age in an environment like that meant that I you know, you expected your prayers to be answered mm. and you expected to have a life that was somehow um, not as human as everybody else's. Mm. And so this idea then began to really unravel for me at that time. I had a lot of questions about church, a lot of questions about how we do church, a lot of questions about the Bible and how we read the Bible, a yeah. lot of questions about the stories that I had been told and the, the ways that I'd always kind of understood how God moved through the world or those kinds of things. So all those things were all present there. I had a lot of questions about women and women's place in mm -hmm. the, the church mm -hmm. and women's roles in the church. Um, a lot of questions about how, you know, we, we looked at things like um, justice and peacemaking and, um, you know, having some sort of presence and awareness of the world. And so, I mean, all those questions were all there, but I remember the thing that I think really unraveled me mm. was um, in my early twenties in the early years of, of our marriage, we experienced just miscarriages one after another. After another. Mm. And the realization that like, I did everything right. I ticked every single box that I was told to tick and yeah. still every prayer went unanswered and every loss accumulated. Yeah. And there was no sense of like, well, now what? Yeah. Right. What does it look like to no longer pray in this 
um, overcomer victory demanding kind of way any yeah. longer. But then what is the point of prayer? What is what is the role of God here? Like, what does this even mean? What does it mean to grieve well? Is there even room for grief in here? I remember later on, like years and years later, reading Barbara Brown Taylor's book, Learning to Walk in the Dark. And she talks about like there being two different types of Christians. There's solar Christians and lunar Christians. Yeah. And we were staunchly in that solar Christian world. Yeah. Everything is we explain what that means. Yeah. yeah like the it, sun it is exists. always shining, right? Yeah, like, the sun is yeah. always shining. There's this narrative of like certainty and victory and and things, you know, if this, then that. Um, if you do this, then this will happen. Um, if you, you know, there there's almost like this um literalism to it, but almost a demand on it, like an ex like very oral Roberts expect a miracle kind of dynamic. Yeah. And then this idea of like embracing things like mystery and grief and lament um, of, of being human and the, the experience of being human. Um, that was, that was what kind of started, you know, really the whole process. And so yeah. for me, that unraveling, I think then led to the realization that like, when, when you have a broken heart, almost anything and everybody can kind of tumble in right to that that breaking hmm. that can happen. And so that was even, I think, really deeply tied to my first kind of awakenings of like, oh, there's there's a whole world going on outside of my own small griefs and sorrows. Because again, very, very ordinary thing, right? A lot of people have a story like that. It's hardly yeah. something that's like, you know, odd or or completely out of the realm of the experience. But it just so knocked me back that then it can open you up more to those larger things of like, well, what is, what does a life look like then? What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to, um, to be part of the body of Christ? What does it mean? How do I understand scripture? How do I understand my life? How do I understand all these different moving parts? And then of course, it's like, you know, when you have a snaked thread on a sweater, you pull it and it, the whole thing can kind of unravel. And that's yeah. how that felt. Definitely. Well, and so I'm curious in terms of you've used the word deconstruction and not having had that word, you know, 20 years ago, but it is a word now that a lot of people are talking about in terms of a movement really among, mm -hmm. um, especially even people who've come up through American evangelicalism and who are asking those same types of questions. Um, and yet I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about what it means to deconstruct, but also that is there a contrast to the idea of deconstruction and evolving faith? Um, you, you, you write about this a little bit in the book, but I, I just wondered if you talk about that in general, but also in terms of your own sense of, you know, was your faith deconstructed? Was it evolving? What, what, how is that all working from that point of everything is a big question mark? Yeah, I, I struggle sometimes with the word deconstruction, I think because it sounds so much more orderly than it feels. Mm. <laughs> And, and so I, I don't ever want to be overly critical of words that have been helpful in healing for a lot of other folks that have yeah. given name to their own experiences. So if phrases like deconstruction or faith shift are helpful for people, like there's no part of me that wants to take that away. I think for me, um, the reason why I've grown to embrace even that phrase and evolving faith um, is, is maybe two, two or threefold. I think um, it, it harkens back to something that Father Richard Rohr talks about, which is learning how to transcend and include hmm. every aspect of yourself or, or maybe all of the different versions of yourself that have existed, yeah. um, as opposed to just kind of saying, well, you know, this old version of myself was, you know, not worthy of love or, or was so misguided or was so whatever else. I want to bring those versions of Sarah along with me. I want to include the very earnest eight-year-old that I was yeah. um, who fell in love with Jesus. I want to include like the very sincere, overly zealous teenage Sarah who was like, you know, born again, all over again. I want to include the Jesus feminist version of me and the brand new know-it-all young mom that I was yeah. for a number of years on the internet. Yeah. And I want to, you know, bring along even the angry years, mm -hmm. um, the years when I felt um, like there was nothing worth saving in Christianity. And I wanted to burn everything down and not be a part mm -hmm. of it any longer. Like all those versions of me all get to come along yeah, and they want to be included. So I think that's part of the reason why I like the phrase evolving faith. The other reason why is because of something that Rachel said at 
um, our first evolving faith gathering. Hmm. And it would have been back in 2018, uh, just six months before she passed away. Hmm. And one of the things she talked about that first year was to say, an evolving faith doesn't mean an evolved faith. Hmm. It it doesn't mean that it that somehow you are so much further ahead. Uh, <laughs> that there yes, is this yes. element of like pridefulness to it. Yes. And um and that was kind of the spirit behind what she was saying. But one of the things that she actually said was that um an evolving faith is a faith that is adapted in order to survive. Hmm. And in some ways I feel like that's oftentimes where I have felt a lot of affinity is saying it's it's not meant to be static. Mm-hmm. Like the whole the whole point of faith is is not necessarily to say, well, now it's done and dusted. I've got everything organized in a three ring binder, every answer to every single possible scenario. I've got all my ducks in the row. Like yeah. that's if you can get to the end of your life with the exact same opinions and beliefs that you had at the beginning, then you have missed the point. Right. And you have missed so many invitations from the Holy Spirit mm. to um, grow and to change and to increase and grow in love and in strength and in wisdom yeah. um, in relation not only to yourself and God, but to your neighbor and mm. to the world. And so I think there is something there that I find really appealing. Um, I know a lot of folks like the phrase deconstruction, and I think it's super helpful, but I wanted something that would include. Um, what happens next and what it looks like to maybe um, dream again, to reimagine, to include, to name harm and sorrow and lament while having room for like beauty and goodness and wonder mm-hmm. and curiosity within me. Um, that, and I still really just have stars in my eyes about Jesus. <laughs> so that, that tends to hang on to. Yeah. And I'm, uh, there are a couple of things I want to pick up on, on what you just said. One is just, there's a chapter you have about, um, not discarding things that you think you've outgrown, which you kind of just spoke to. Um, but that sense of there are some things that, um, you're talking about kind of Marie kondo your life and how, you know, we might think that minimalism is fantastic. And yet there actually are a lot of things that it's like really sweet to hold on to and that you found um, in that process of kind of an evolving faith, realizing that some of these things that might have seemed outdated or worn out at a certain time in your life have come back around as some, some things that are precious to you. And I really appreciated that because um, both to the point of we don't like we can be tender with the parts of ourselves that um, I think I'm as a Christian might have been embarrassed. I, I still feel a little embarrassed by myself as a teenager. Um, oh. Or like, <laughs> listen, I had a bumper sticker on the back of my brown pickup that said, "Get a life, be a Christian." I okay, mean, yeah. I don't know what to yeah. do. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have that bumper sticker, but I was the girl like handing out leather crosses in the hallway and like with some sort of little piece of paper that was going to in like a hundred words or less, tell you everything you needed in order to be saved, you know, like, and, and I look back on that and I'm like, oh gosh, that is cringy. But I'm also like, okay, that, like that heart I, there was nothing insincere. There was nothing condemning. Like I just, it was like, I have discovered the most beautiful, wonderful thing, person. And I want you to know, like, and, and I want to hold on to that girl who really, really loves Jesus, even though I will never, um, ever, ever give someone a leather <laughs> cross again, you know? <laughs> uh-huh. it's, I think sometimes too, like maybe, and maybe you've had this experience too, maybe Julia of like, I don't know that this is the book I could have written in my twenties. Yeah. Right. Because the, the book that I would have written in the immediate intensity of my first experience with faith shift. Now at this point, I have gone through about 16 different types mm. of deconstruction, yeah. and 16 different types of, of faith evolution or whatever you want to call it. There, there is something I think as you get older about learning to forgive the old versions of yourself. Yeah. Right. And learning to love those old versions of yourself, which maybe then gives you room to reclaim or um, maybe even repurpose. Because, I mean, you certainly don't approach those things the same way you did as a 15 year old or as a 25 year old or as a 35 year old. Like you just you're going to approach things differently with a lot more story, a lot more relationship, a lot more community, a lot more, you know, 
perspective and experience and I mean, God, hopefully wisdom, you know, if we're lucky. <laughs> so, you, know, know. You, you do kind of re- find yourself revisiting even old memories and old versions of yourself or old stories you told um, yourself in order to kind of, you know, move through those seasons with maybe some more clarity from that perspective, I guess, or, or more forgiveness. Maybe you, I think maybe that's just it. Maybe at this point in my life, in my mid forties, I'm just a bit more hungry for grace and forgiveness and mercy. <laughs> I've been, yeah, when I, and I, when think, I was a bit more of a know-it-all. Right. I mean, but it's also, I wonder whether the experience of being a mom also, where it's like just watching your kids and being like, oh, I see you. I mean, and, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I remember those questions and I don't know, I I feel like they've helped me um, have a lot more kind of grace for myself. I also the other thing what you were just saying made me think about was in my early 20s, I was mid 20s, I was married, had been married for a couple of years. And my mother-in-law was a single woman um, diagnosed with liver cancer. And so my husband and I were her primary caregivers um, towards the end of her life. And she was um, a person who had been in and out of the church for a variety of reasons, the Episcopal Church. Um, and she was, you know, kind of a liberal feminist would have been the way I described her at the time. And I would not have meant that necessarily in positive terms at the time, <laughs> you know. Um, and she definitely was not coming from the type of Christianity that I was, much less the culture. You know, I'm from uh, right. New England. She's from New Orleans, all these things. Um And so, and I felt really kind of threatened by her community in the sense that, you know, she has friends who are praying kind of nonchalantly, like, I don't know how serious they were, but to Buddha, or you have people who are just calling upon the spirits to be present in this place. Um, And there were various, you know, um, Episcopalians at various points of devotion or not, um, many of whom did not read the Bible. We're not talking about Jesus, all of these things. And yet being present and witnessing this community of people who showed up with Mm -hmm. the love of Christ, whether or not that name was ever on their lips day in and day out, I literally was like, okay, I have a choice here. Like I can either say, yeah, I know that guy. Like I know what's happening here. And, And I think what I, what I found, I remember at the time feeling like, I'm afraid that if I let my understanding of God expand, what happens at the same time is that God becomes shallow. Mm -hmm. And what I, over the course of that experience, the picture I got was like, there's not a fixed amount of water here. Like God is expanding in both depth, breadth, height, width, like that's all that's happening because my understanding of love is really growing. Um, And I don't think I even had those words for it at the time. That's kind of now how I look back on it. But the being, bearing witness, like being present to these, at that time, adults, I mean, I was 24 or something. And, you know, these are all people in their 50s who just showed up and loved someone really Mm -hmm. well day in and day out um, and did not do that in the Christian ways, with the Christian theology I thought they were supposed to have. Um, It really did just expand my understanding of who God was, of both the mystery and to your point, the kind of depths of grief and sorrow that are are coming with life in this world and the possibilities for joy and celebration and wonder alongside those things. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, just for me, that was one of those early experiences that I think would be now, I would say, a part of a a very much an evolving faith. And I like that idea, as you said, of like adapting, surviving, but also of um, of just growing and changing, as you said, not in a way that's superior to somebody else, but just it's a way of like continuing to live life and to live life Mm -hmm. with a God who continues to be alive um, and Mm -hmm. not stagnant or stuck in a box somewhere. I think you're exactly right. I think that maybe that's part of why I had a draw towards it is because even deconstruction isn't to me is an aspect of evolving faith. Yeah. Because there will be some tearing down. There will be some removal. There will be this need to say, oh, you know what? This was super toxic. You know what? This was, this was, this was something that damaged and hurt me, Mm -hmm. or this is something that damaged and hurt people I love or people who are in my community or whatever. And there are things worth, you know, pulling up by the roots and getting rid of. Absolutely. But that's not the total experience of, you know, if I can use really churchy language, which I still love, like spiritual formation. Yeah. Right. And this idea of like, 
that then would include beautiful experiences and would include the things that add to us, right? That would include the things like having these encounters with people who were so different than you in your 50s and really being able to understand Romans 8, right? Of like, this is the, the depth and the height, and the breadth of the love of God, yeah, right? And so I think maybe that's part of why I'm drawn to it a little bit because there was this part of me that wanted room for those experiences. Yeah. That wanted room for the ones that didn't um, steal from me or, um, or need to be removed. Those things were all still there. And that's part of it. But I also wanted the things that expanded me and that opened up my heart, um, that helped me love people more, uh, see God differently. I think some of the best ways that I've being able to hold on to loving God has been hearing from people in, from a completely different social location than me, mm-hmm. and why they love God and how they experience God. You know, those are, are things that have just enriched and brought so much goodness and, and a different view of how I view the spirit, a different view of how I view the love of God, how I view acceptance and welcome and inclusion. I mean, all those things. I'm curious, just from hearing you talk, thinking what it makes me think about is you write a little bit about how we can move from being kind of um, simplistic and fundamentalist in one side of the religious spectrum and just move to the same thing, but in kind of different version of, um, and I feel like, especially right now in American Christianity, it's really easy for people in kind of my space, which is, um, you know, kind of on the moderate or progressive Christianity side of things to be, um, pretty condemning and certainly critical of evangelicalism. And I certainly came out of evangelicalism that I did not have most of the toxic experiences just because I was at a mainline church with an evangelical experience. And so there was actually this wonderful blend of like best of both worlds type of thing happening. And I learned and grew a lot and felt really um, grateful. At the same time, I would no longer call myself an evangelical for various reasons, largely to do with American politics. Um, But I want to be really careful not to come into a posture of condemnation of evangelicals in some broad sense, while also being able to name the things that are, um, yeah, whether the word is toxic or just hurtful or, I don't know, even just like theologically distorted or um, incorrect. And I wonder how you hold that space because I one of the things one of the things I think that attracts me to your writing is a tone of gentleness and grace, but at the same time a willingness to name things that are not okay. Um, and, and so I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on how we what the posture of our heart or how we use language that is going to be in that space of kind of grace and truth or um, yeah not pulling back or shrinking back from saying that's not okay. And yet also having that expansive welcome that doesn't only include the people um, who are kind of on the margins, but also the people who maybe are in the center (laughs) or Mm -hmm. something. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? No, I think that that's a, I think that's a thing that a lot of folks are kind of grappling with right now and Mm -hmm. and trying to take a run at. Um, I think one of the, one of the harder things I think about growth and change is um, it's not only the discomfort that it brings to yourself, but the discomfort it can bring to you, like your community and your, your primary place of belonging. And oftentimes being in total agreement is like the currency of belonging. Yes. Yes. And so it doesn't take a whole lot uh, to find yourself on the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that some of the things that have been helpful for me, um, in, in walking and let me be very clear. I have done this wrong so many times. <laughs> I have, I have, there, there's a long list of all the ways where I could have done this better over the years, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but some of the things that I have found really helpful for me. Um, I remember, uh, Jeff Chu who ran, uh, evolving faith with me for a number of years. Um, and as a dear friend, um, Jeff once really, really challenged our evolving faith community by saying, "You're like your deconstruction can't just be for you," hmm. and that um, I think was a hard message for some folks to hear and receive. But at the same time, it has been really clarifying, I think, for a lot of us that it has to be connected to more than just um, our own spirituality, our own yeah. faith, our own understanding of how we move through the world. And so that, to me, is like 
what's the invitation then to not become, not give up being a very conservative fundamentalist to swap it out for being a, now a very progressive fundamentalist? Yes, yes. Because that's that's not actually the invitation, right? The invitation is that here trade this set of opinions and certainties for a nice new set of opinions mm-hmm. and certainties. You may change your opinions and minds about all sorts of theological and political uh, things, and, and you probably should. But the the larger invitation that I think that we're being invited to is that one of um, not feeling like somehow because you're right, you get an exemption from the fruits of spirit. Mm. That somehow because I'm so right in what I think or believe here, Mm. I am somehow absolved from needing to follow Jesus or needing to be someone who is has love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and even despite the internet self control. <laughs> and so you know so that invitation for me has always been a bit of a, a snag yeah. um in a, in the best way you know to kind of slow down a little bit on some of those things. The other thing that I found a lot of helpfulness around it does feel to me and this is where you'll see my Pentecostal adjacent charismatic self still coming through yeah. um, is, is around this notion of like powers and principalities, hmm. which is like big King James language that I still yeah. really like. And so Paul talks about like there being powers and principalities and that this is what we are warring against, that this is the actual struggle that we're engaged in. It's not against people. It is against these powers and principalities yeah. that are at work. And I like big language like that, I think, because these are big things that deserve big language, whether you're talking mm. about racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, ca- you know, the, the capitalism and the, 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 you know, churn of war that we are yeah. in the midst of. Like, these are powers and principalities. These, these yep. deserve big words. And so that's where things like maybe even in particular the past 10 years that we've seen in the West, like I even feel really comfortable using the phrase apocalypse for it in like the truest sense of the word, meaning that it's an unveiling. Yeah. It's a revelation. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, all the things that we kind of quietly agreed to, um, not entirely sure who all I mean by using the word we, because <laughs> it doesn't mean everybody. Yeah, <laughs> it right. usually means a particular kind of white evangelicalism. Yeah. But there is this sense of like, Oh, now it's all out here. All the things that we thought we had hidden, all the things that were in the lurking in the corners, um, that were always part of the story, but maybe we just never really acknowledged whether it was even the, um, you know, rapid churn of abuse that is, that happens within churches, whether it's the political, um, you know, aspects that have just, you know, driven the church into such a, a, a broken, you know, place right now. Yeah. And so you can look at all of those things and say, yeah, okay, you know what, this is, this is language that's helpful for me to say um, that these are powers and principalities at work. This is the thing that we are engaged with. And what is the invitation then from the spirit in this place that would actually look not like uh, naivete, but like an actual strong muscular kind of love and peacemaking and goodness and mercy? What does it look like? Um, to continue to build on ramps for transformation? Mm-hmm. What does it look like to make room for people to change their minds and grow and evolve? Um, you know, th- those are those are questions I'm interested in right now, I guess. Yeah, thank you for that. That's really helpful. And I think the um, both of those, that it's a little kind of like the little picture in the sense of like individual looking at our own life. And you write in the book just about like, the fruit of the spirit is a good guide post. Like um, we've got that. Um, and rightness is not one of them, right? Like that's not a fruit of the spirit. So I think that's really important. But then also that more big picture, uh, I'm aware right now, just as you may know, our oldest daughter, Penny has a, uh, has down syndrome and she's about to turn 18. So we're kind of coming up against the bureaucratic system of disability in America. Um, What's amazing to me is every single individual I talk to within that bureaucracy could not be more kind and generous and want to be helpful. And yet the laws are written in such a way that that makes it almost impossible for any of us to do what we think is right. Like, and so anyway, it's just been this new moment of like understanding the difference between an individual and a system. And yet I love asking that question of like, what does strong, like a robust love look like in the midst of this? And I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but that's helpful for me, even in just um, thinking about it. And then I wonder also, 
there's a whole chapter in the book about um, not only being against things, but for things. So you give the example of like, I'm not just against the prosperity gospel, I'm for generosity. I'm not just against racism, I'm for human flourishing. So I wanted to ask you just to talk a little bit about the danger that comes if we only know what we're against, but then also like what opportunities are there for us to turn in the direction of what we are for and not only, you know, turning away from what we're against. Right. I think, I I think that's something that is almost um, one of the things that has made me angriest at God Mm -hmm. (laughs) the last number of years, because um, I think a lot of us start with what we're against and that's a good starting point. There are things that are worth being against. And so you're not going to find me being someone who's like, well, that's, that's, you know, whatever, not, you know, or being hard on it. I think a lot of times that's where you start, right? You start with knowing that, that this isn't right. No, there is something here that is, is fundamentally dehumanizing, or Mm -hmm. there's something here that is, um, that doesn't feel right or look right or, or is right in the midst of all of it. But I think the thing that we often miss then is the invitation to to be able to name what we're for. Mm -hmm. And so that to me is the thing that I've become a little bit more interested in, maybe, you know, through a lot of this work and a lot of these conversations, is that to me, oftentimes, that's where the, um, our calling maybe is hiding, is kind of at that intersection of anger and joy, Mm. right? Where it's like, here's the thing that makes me angry. Here's the thing that, that, that makes that, that hackles rise on the back of my head, on the back of my neck. Like these, this is the thing that just like, this is not right. And this is not yeah, stop. Yeah. And I'm willing to protest and I'm willing to march and I'm going to write the letters and I'm going to mm. lobby politicians. And I'm going to go show up at the elder board with a stack of footnoted, you know, points I want to make, like yeah. whatever it is that, that is driving you. And that is, oh, that can be a holy, holy thing. Right. Mm. That the spirit can be involved in that. Like there's no, no part of me that thinks that somehow that's, you know, divorced from that. But this other aspect that I think is the part maybe we've missed is that the anger might start us there, but it won't sustain us in the work. And -hmm. I think that especially in terms of just, I mean, even to your point about how, you know, a lot of aspects of mothering have opened us up, Mm -hmm. you know, to a lot of this. Like there's got to be something that looks a lot more like love and joy and what you are hoping for. Yeah. to help sustain that over the long haul for all of these, these years and the, the tediousness and the, the bureaucracy and the, the millions and millions of forms in order, to get, in order to access support and services. Like these, these right, are the, right. these are, this is our life. And so there's this aspect to me about the invitation of learning and leaning into what we are for. Yeah. And even this, the, the discipline if I can use that word, sure. um, around having some openness to that, you know, and, and then moving in that direction. To me, that looks a lot more like resistance. It looks a lot more like healing work. It looks a lot more like um, a lot of the fruit of the spirit. And then it even gives you something to hope for. Right. And so I think that that's one of the things that maybe I have grappled with over these last number of years is when I say things like hope and love and peace and joy and like those that has to is that enough for the powers and principalities for the the questions of our time for the the challenges that we kind of are facing right now. And and my hope is, is that yes, yes, they are. Mm-hmm. But, but only if we can lean into and keep pushing through what we're against or what's causing rage or causing anger or or that we're identifying as injustice or that we're identifying as something that's sinful or wrong or broken or or that's causing damage. What is the invitation to name what I'm hoping for that? Um, Whether it's for my kids, whether it's for my neighborhood, whether it's for my neighbors, whether it's for people halfway around the world, I'm I'm hoping for peace. But that means then that that places um, a demand for engagement as opposed to just optimism and wishing. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'm just, as you're speaking, thinking to the ways in which um, like the Bible and various places, whether it's the old Testament or the new um, speaks yes to what God is against, but 
very much in the context of what God is for. Um, right. And the sense of like, why is God against injustice and oppression and um, all of Let's these things? Because God is all the way. for, <laughs> yeah, love and for humans, you know, and for flourishing. But flourishing is not just about, you know, individual success or whatever, but actually mm -hmm. communal. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, just helpful. And as you said, I think, um, that righteous anger can only sustain us for so long um, before it becomes cynicism or despair, honestly. I think it even gives you a path to follow. Like, I, I mean, in the book, I even talk about my friends over at Heartline. Um, oh, yes. We tell really, the story. Yeah. That really it's amazing. Well, I don't know if we have time for it all, but well, that's ever stopped me. <laughs> a little before. bit of it. A little <laughs> bit of it. <laughs> There's a reason why I usually have an editor is because I'm an oversharer. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that ended up happening was, um, you know, Heartline operated in Haiti as a an adoption agency, essentially. Yeah. And there were a lot of other aspects of what they they did as well. But in a lar large part of their work for a lot of those years was placing Haitian babies into usually American homes. And the realization that it never ended. That there were always always more traumatized mothers, always too much maternal death, always too much poverty. And the amount of children who came through their doors who actually had families, right? you know, it just, there, there were so many different aspects that are connected to deep justice issues and development work and NGOs and colonization. I mean, there's just a million different, you know, tentacles at work here, but what it came down to was their decision to say, okay, if we're against, you know, lonely kids, not being raised by their families. Yeah then what is the invitation to be for something? And yeah. so there were a lot of factors at play and it's a really long story, but ultimately they ended up transitioning to being a maternal care center. And so they, they deliver babies and, yeah. and, and help raise up women to be strong mothers and they connect them with one another. And it's become this incredibly beautiful, like Haitian led, you know, initiative towards economic development and family connection and keeping women with their babies and, it it just it I think in a thousand births only one woman felt the need to relinquish her child. Yeah, all those babies are being raised in their culture and in their homes and in their communities and in their families, and women were not dying in childbirth and like mid midwives were being trained and nurses and like care practitioners and so it's like it has morphed into this really beautiful thing of like we if we're for this mm -hmm. then what would that look like. Yeah, And so it seems like a small example in one particular corner, in one particular community in the world. But to me, it became almost emblematic of saying, okay, well, we can be against things literally all day long. And that, that can be helpful. But now what? Yeah. And what does it look like for women to be able to, to raise their babies, to, to be able to move through childbirth in safety and security, to feel supported in those early weeks and months and years of motherhood, to find connection and community, to have um, economic opportunities and development for families. I mean, just you can change whole stories in a generation. Mm. Yeah, I thought that was a really profound and beautiful example, especially because, you know, who's going to argue with an adoption agency finding homes for kids and yeah, then for one. them to internally be like, hey, wait a second, we are unwittingly contributing to the problem that we are trying to solve. How can mm -hmm. we think about this differently? And then fi figuring that out, like finding a way to do that. Um, but I, I loved that. I love that example so much. Um, well, I know we're coming to the end of our time. And so I wanted to just ask one final question as I look at the subtitle of your book. So the, you know, the title is Field Notes for the Wilderness, but then the subtitle is Practices for an Evolving Faith. And we've talked about some of the practices um, that, you know, might be a part of an evolving faith, but I just wanted to close by asking if there is any other, you know, practice that you have found helpful along the way of your own faith shift, evolution, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> movement and growth? Like what, what's up, what one or two, whatever you want to share practices of evolving faith. That's, that's a good one. Um, I think that that's part of maybe where even the origin point of the book was, was mm -hmm. saying, um, here are the things that have served me really well in the wilderness. Here are the things that I have found to be actually practically helpful, whether that's practices or postures, ways of approaching the world. Um, one of the ones that I think 
I think one of the aspects when you're talking in a lot of deconstruction conversations or evolving faith conversations, um, it can come with a lot of anger and rage and grief and loss um, and trauma yeah. for a lot of folks. Um, but one of the things that I have found that is very consistent in experience and yet not a lot of people talk about is the, the gifts of it hmm. and the goodness of it. And this thing of saying, um, yes, maybe you lost belonging here, but then what does it look like to have belonging in the full totality of who you are? Um, one of the things that really, really mattered to me um, and has become part of my own you know, spiritual formation and practice and, and ways of moving through the world is the one about learning to love the world again. Mm. And to learning how to see the wonder and the curiosity and the goodness of, of the world again, learning to let myself love it, not in general, like God so loved the world. And I'm just going to love the world. Like, no, in, in a particularity, mm. right. In, a, in, in, in an actual place with an actual people being able to name, these are the things that bring me joy. These mm. are the things that, these are the places where I found belonging. And these are the, the, the moments that I've grown to love and even erasing that weird imaginary line we can kind of create between what's sacred and what's secular, mm -hmm. like somehow they're separate. And instead being like, no, like everything is alive with the goodness and love of God mm. and everything can be this, this almost this altar, right? Where you encounter um, God. And so being able to almost like rebaptize your ordinary life yep. as a place where you meet with God and you minister and you move. I mean, God, it has just given back so much laughter and joy and curiosity mm. and even a sense of wonder when I used to think that I needed to have every single thing answered, there's something really beautiful about saying like, I don't know. Mm. And, and, and having that level of, um, I think even delight yeah, and, and stubbornness around hope. Um, that to me is something that is one of the gifts on the other side of deconstruction. One of the gifts of, of engaging mm. in, um, in an, an evolving form of faith is saying, yes, all these things are here too. And also there's so much to love and there's so much goodness mm. and so much joy and so much connection and belonging and beauty. Um, maybe even in the things that I was taught to distrust or right. be wary of. Those would be good surprises. I should totally just say, we're going to end it right there, but I have to bring up, um, because that was beautiful and thank you, but I just have to bring up this one little story that you share of, um, your kids sleeping outside and it's like two o'clock in the morning and you hear them talking, like they've woken up. And one of them says, as they look at the stars, I can't believe we always sleep through this. And I mean, that to me was such this like perfect and beautiful anecdote for exactly what you just said, that there are these wondrous things happening and we might be asleep and like not even know they're happening. And I loved that they woke each other up and were like, wait a second, this has always <laughs> been happening and we've been asleep. Like, and I just, I don't know. I feel like um, what you just said is in keeping with becoming people who notice the wonder, you know, who mm -hmm. wake up and who see it and who say, oh, Oh my gosh. And I have to tell somebody else. Um, because again, that's what I'm for is for the beauty and the wonder and sharing that in love with other people. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, I just, I, I loved all these stories, but, um, I also just, uh, love getting a chance to talk to you about them. And I'm grateful for, um, this book and for the work that you do, you know, in all these other spaces as well. So thank you for being here with us and thank you for these words. Oh, thank you so much, Amy Julia. I've enjoyed this so much. Thank you.